Good morning. It is May 24th, uh, Memorial Day weekend, and I'm so glad to have this opportunity to come together again and spend a little time uh, worshiping together. Hope you had a chance to do that already, spending some time looking into God's Word. We're actually jumping out of John's Gospel for a couple of weeks. Thought I would take some time and just poke into some things I think we all could stand to hear right now. Uh, we're in I don't know what week it is. It's, it's hard to even know what day it is most of the time here with the coronavirus, but I think it's, uh, what, month two and a half of the what was supposed to be a two-week shutdown. So uh, it sounds like things are beginning to, to relax some. It is certainly our hope and prayer that in the coming week or, or few weeks that we will be able to meet once again in our church sanctuary here for at least modified services as, as some of the concerns and the, um, the precautions begin to be relaxed. So we'll certainly keep uh, the church family up to date on everything going on there. But, uh, you know, let's just take a moment before we even get into our study. Let's take a moment and pray and just pray for God's continued hand in all of the things that are going on in our lives. Let's do that now. God, we do thank you for, uh, again, your you're promise that you're always with us here as your children. I thank you that you do continue to show your presence in so many ways. And God, we need that right now. With everything that's been going on in life, I know that uh, this has dragged on a long time for most everybody, regardless of how we feel about it. It's been, it's been a difficult time. And just to know that you're there for us always is uh, something, Lord, that I think can be such a comfort to us. So, God, as we look into your word and seek to draw encouragement from it, I pray that you would have already begun your work by your Holy Spirit of preparing our hearts and our minds and our ears for what you have for us. God, we, we need your hand on this world, on the situation with the coronavirus, but we need your hand on us as well. Help us, Lord, to draw close to you, to learn from you, and to love you, Lord, to seek to love you just as much as you love us. I thank you for this time and for everyone who's joining us today, and we seek to praise, honor, and glorify you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've got to say, and, and I'm just, I'm going to be very candid here, I'm tired. I am. I am just, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired tired of the coronavirus. I'm tired of the shutdown. I'm tired of nothing being the way it used to be. I am tired of having to figure out new ways of doing things that used to be so easy to do, but we're having to figure out still new ways of doing these things. And in all honesty, I'm feeling just a bit worn out right now. There is so much fear and anxiety in our society, around our world right now, whether it's the fear of the COVID-19 virus, whether it's the fear of financial collapse from how long the shutdown is going on, or, or even just the, the plain old fear of things never getting back to normal, that things are going to be different. People are just afraid. And that's not even to take into account all of the pre-COVID-19 fears and struggles that we all have dealt with off and on every day of our lives. It's just a difficult time right now, and it's tiring. In times of struggle, I'll speak for myself again, sometimes I just feel like, and maybe you too, I just feel like my strength is not sufficient to get me through it. And, and uh, just this past week, I found myself saying things like, I don't have it, Lord. I just, I don't have it. I don't have it in me to keep doing this. I, 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 I don't have what it takes. I don't have it in me to, to lead the church through this time. It's too hard. And in those times of discouragement, I think sometimes we find ourselves asking, look, if I don't have the strength, where's it going to come from? How am I going to get through this if I can't do it? Where does my help come from? And as I wrestled with some of those thoughts the, the middle of this past week, it was very interesting. I found 
my mind drifting to, oh gosh, I think it was a song that I, I remember singing in our, our high, church high school group or college group or something. It was a, a song from years ago that was based on Psalm 121. And, and it was just running through my mind there. And here's what the psalmist says in the opening couple verses of Psalm 121. He says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I don't know if you've struggled like I have with, with these kind of thoughts and difficulties during this uh, very peculiar time of life, but if you have, I want to share something with you this morning. I want to share something with you to encourage you. See, God is the one who is here to help us always and constantly. God is the one who provides us with strength and protection and a strategy as we face the, the one who is our true adversary. This morning, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take us to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus. And towards the very end of his letter there, Paul speaks about God's help for us in the struggles that we face. What Paul did as he was closing up his letter to the Ephesians is he took something in their society, there's something that people saw all the time, and he used it as an example of how God strengthens us, prepares us, protects us, equips us for kind of the everyday struggles, the, the battles that we face, especially as Christians. He pointed out Roman soldiers. Uh, Roman soldiers were everywhere in Paul's day. And what he did is he kind of took the armor that they wore constantly, and he used that to describe just what God does in kind of preparing and protecting us for the daily battle so that we might be able to fight and survive spiritually. So in our text this morning, what I want us to see, just right from the front here, I want us to see that God is the one who strengthens us, who protects us, and who provides us with a strategy as we face off against the one who is our true adversary. So if you would, take a Bible with me and turn it to the book of Ephesians in your New Testament. So we've been in the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you've got Acts and Romans and the two letters to the Corinthians. And then you're getting mighty close. You get Galatians and Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians. If you get to the Thessalonians and the Timothy letters, you've gone too far. Ephesians is what we're looking for right after Galatians. Ephesians chapter 6, so last chapter of the book, and we're going to pick up this morning in verse 10. So Ephesians 6, 10. And Paul starts right there by explaining the source of our strength, or what should be the intended source of our strength. Here's what Paul does. Right before we even read verse 10, he tells us straight away not to let our fears overwhelm us. Don't allow your fears to overwhelm you. Instead, recognize, here's what we need to recognize. We are not the source of the strength that we need to be able to endure these struggles and these difficult times. Instead, our strength is found in the Lord. Follow along as I read verse 10 for us. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. What Paul indicates for us here is that Christians, believers in Jesus, we don't empower ourselves to be able to endure the difficulties that we face in life. Becoming strong in the sense that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians 6 it's something that, I guess you could say, it's done to Christians. It's not something they do for themselves. It's something that's done to them. Our strength to face off against the struggles that we experience in life, that comes from an external source. It comes from the Lord God. We are to be 
continually, Paul says here, continually made strong in the Lord. We need to seek to know God's strength. We need to seek to draw close to God, to be strengthened by Him, to endure everything that we are up against. Because He doesn't want us to attempt the battle. He doesn't want us to face the struggle in our own strength. We don't have what it takes. I was quite right when I said, God, I don't have it. I don't. I need God's strength to be able to make it through the things that I face. You need God's strength to make it through the things that you are facing, the struggles, the battles. Individually, we're not equipped to make it on our own. We are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And that brings us to the second half of what Paul kind of calls us to do there in verse 10. God's strength is mighty. It's the strength of God's might or His mighty strength. That speaks of the strength of God's power, the the enormity of God's power, the greatness of it. And I've got to say, it is It is truly beyond our comprehension just how powerful the Lord God really is. But here's the really exciting thing about that. For all of this power that God has, that power, the strength of His might, is made available to His children. And we are called upon to be made strong in the strength of God's might. We can be absolutely sure of receiving God's power, of receiving His strength to face our daily struggles and our daily battles. We can be sure of receiving God's power of being made strong in Him. Actually, as Christians, it's not even something we have to ask for. It is already given to us. It is simply commanded that we find our strength in Him. It's there. We just need to seek to draw close to God to make use of it, to be availed of His strength that He wants to provide to us to face the battles. Here's the thing. If you have a relationship with God through faith in Christ, then you can be assured that God has given you His power to face the struggles that you face. By faith, a person becomes God's child. We are called as Christians children of God. Now, if you think about an earthly mother or father, right, a a loving parent, they respond with all the strength they have to help their child when that child is in need. If that child is in danger, you're going to see mom lift the car bumper right off that kid to get them out from under the car, right? So much more so then does our Heavenly Father bring all of His strength to bear to help His children in their times of struggle? And, and the, the reason why the answer to that question is simple. It's because God loves us that much. God loved us so much that He sent His own Son, Jesus, to pay the price For our sins, that penalty for our wrongdoings, He sent His Son Jesus to take that on Himself, to pay that penalty, to die for our sins on that cross. God spent His Son's precious blood to purchase us back from the consequences of our sins, to to give us that free offer of grace and forgiveness that we can receive freely by faith in Jesus. Now, if God has spent something so precious as His own Son's blood to purchase you, let me just say, something that is so hard, one is not something He is easily or readily going to give up. If God has gone to that extent to save you, He's not going to let you go. We are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. There are plenty of opportunities in our life to draw on that power. Uh, We can put it to to the test in several situations. For instance, those times when we are weighed down by the knowledge of our own sin, 
when we are just feeling the weight of all of those poor choices that we've made, those wrong things that we have willingly done, here's what we need to remember in those moments. There is no sin that is so powerful that it outmatches God's strength and ability to forgive it. There is no sin that we can commit that we cannot come to the Lord and ask for His forgiveness and find that He is powerful enough to forgive it. God's power is available for forgiveness. We can tap into the Lord's strength when we struggle with temptation in our own lives. You know, Scripture says that with every temptation that God allows to come your way, He always provides a way of escape. Every temptation that any one of us face in life, there is always an escape hatch that we can pull the handle on. And, and sometimes we just don't realize it's there. But it shows up in a lot of ways. You know? so, so here's the way it shows up. The way of escape, don't reply to that post that offended you so much. You, you might save yourself from being just as offensive. Just don't reply. Don't answer it. Turn the computer off. Uh, you know, other temptations. Look the other way. Hold your tongue. Ignore the driver in the next lane or behind you and in front of you that's driving like an idiot. You know, just don't engage them. Pull that escape handle and say, you know what? I'm going to choose to not get sucked into whatever's going wrong with that other person. We're also called to draw on God's strength when we feel overwhelmed, even overwhelmed by the things that God has called us to do. Sometimes we can look at the things that God has called us to do, and, and let me say it happens as a pastor too. There's times I can look at it and say, God, I can't do that. I, I am overwhelmed by it. But the reality is, is that God always gives us what we need to do whatever He has called us to do. If God has called you to do something, He will give you what you need to be able to do it, to be able to obey His calling. I'll tell you, in our day and age, our society right now, I can guarantee you that God certainly wants you to draw on His strength as we seek to endure everything that's associated with this coronavirus. Everything that comes with it. God wants you to draw on His strength to get through it. God is our strength. He's also the one who provides us with our protection. In, in verses 11 and 13, Paul tells us how we are to be made strong in the Lord. We are made strong in the Lord by taking up the protection that He has offered us. Take a look at verses 11 and 13 with me. Paul says, Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And skip down to verse 13. Therefore, he says again, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Put on the full armor of God. That's what Paul says here. God has provided complete protection for us for the battles and the struggles that we face. Put on the armor of God. How are we made strong? We are made strong by putting on God's armor. And we need to always have that armor on, that spiritual armor that He provides us. You see, First and foremost, we need to follow God's command through Paul here, that very simple command, put it on. Okay, simple, but let's say it again, put it on. It doesn't do you any good if you don't put it on. God's armor is perfect. It is designed especially for the battle that we are in, but it only works if we take it up and put it on. 
You know, we don't have Roman soldiers wandering around in our society, but we got plenty of police officers, right? And you guys watch those shows on TV with the, the SWAT team guys and all the stuff that they wear. I mean, we could probably take Paul's words in Roman, or Ephesians 6 here and just, you know, kind of transfer it over to a, a soldier or a SWAT team member or something, and you could figure out the same kind of stuff here. But here's something that police officers do every single shift. I was a police chaplain down in Burbank for uh, a little over three years. I rode along with officers for uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours. Here's something I noticed they did every single shift. You know what they put on? They put on that bulletproof vest right underneath their uniform shirt. Every single shift they put that on because here's the reality. They knew it. We know it. It's not going to do them any good if they leave it in their locker and head out the door, right? It only works if they wear it. They gear up before they head out on patrol. They're not walking out in flip-flops and shorts and, and, and you know, a T-shirt or something like that. It's all the gear all the time, and that bulletproof vest was a part of it. Paul couldn't say it any clearer. The armor of God, put it on. And second, then, we need to keep it on. You put it on and you keep it on. You don't put it on and then, you know, later in the day decide, eh, it's a little uncomfortable. I'm just going to take it off and hang it up over here because now you're unprotected again. No, you put it on and you keep it on. Our Christian armor, that spiritual armor, is designed, it is made to be worn. There's no taking it off until we have finished the fight. And we have not finished the fight until the end of our earthly days or until Christ himself returns to get us. We are in the battle until that time. So we need to have that armor on night and day. We cannot hope to withstand the battle if we are not wearing the armor that God has provided for us. So put it on, pull it close, tighten it up, make sure there's no gaps. You don't want anything loose because let me tell you, our enemy is looking for any gap in that armor that he can fire one of his fiery arrows into. He is looking for any opportunity to get at every one of God's children. God has provided us with his protection. His armor is designed for the battle. It's not just designed to look cool. As Paul spells out, hey, here's kind of what the Christian's armor looks like as we look at the Roman soldier and and faith is like this and, and the gospel's like that and salvation's like this. It's not just to look cool any more than a Roman soldier's armor or, or a SWAT team or a soldier's armor is designed to just look cool. See, understand, our adversary, he is not impressed by a show of force. For a Christian to take up the armor of God and, and to arm ourselves with what God has provided spiritually. That does not amaze him. It does not frighten him. Quite to the contrary, it's, it's almost like, you know, the proverbial waving a red flag in front of a bull. It, it enrages him. The armor of God is intended to be something that is so much more than just what we put on to kind of parade in front of others. We need to be sure it is securely fastened, that we have put it on and that we keep it on because we're going to need it. And it only works if it's on. You know, just total aside, I I enjoy riding a bicycle. I I get out and ride quite frequently, and uh, there there are a few things that drive me more nuts than to see another cyclist riding around with a helmet that's unfastened and just kind of sitting on the back of their head. You know where that helmet's going to be when they fall off or get bumped or hit by a car or something like that? It's going to be somewhere other than their melon. It is not going to be on their head. You know, when a cyclist just clips that helmet to the front of their handlebars, well, it's hot and I'm, I'm riding uphill and I don't want to have it on. It's not going to do them any good. You've got to have the helmet on if it's going to help you. God's armor. Put it on. Keep it on. Because you're going to need it. You're going to need it for the struggles that you face. You're going to need it for the daily battles that we are in. The reason that Paul gives for us to keep on that spiritual armor is he says it's so that we can resist in the evil day. It's so that we can withstand the attack of the enemy. And make no mistake, these are evil days that we live in, right? But 
for as much as we can say, oh yeah, the evil days, and, and we can point to whatever you want to point to to say, well, see, this is evil and that's evil. Uh, the days have quite frankly been evil since Adam and Eve had that little issue with the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. But for as much as there are all these evil days that we can talk about, Paul is pointing to a very singular evil day in verse 13. He is alerting us here to a specific time of attack that comes with extraordinary force, and that, above all other times, is a time when the temptation to yield is so strong. Those are the days, that evil day that Paul is talking about, when any joy in our life just seems to evaporate, and there's just nothing left. It's a time when everything seems difficult. Maybe it's a day when you just can't get your mind off of sins that you've committed in your past. Maybe it's a day when the things that you are doing wrong right now just come into full focus in your life, and you find yourself staring into that mirror and saying, wow, I am making such a mess of things right now. See, we need God's armor to withstand that evil day. Times of trial, times of trouble, of struggle, of spiritual battle in our lives, those are inevitable. And when we are in those battles and they will come to our lives, what we're going to find is there are times when that battle comes in fast and furious and, and it is just absolutely relentless. And we need to be prepared for that evil day. So, how do we do that? Well, the very first thing you need to do is make sure that you have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, you cannot face death without fear unless you belong to the one who has already defeated death by dying on the cross and being raised back to life. See, by nature, we are, let's just say, we're servants to our sin. Our inborn human nature is to just do whatever feels good to us, whatever we set our minds to. That just is kind of our natural bent and if we are just kind of living according to whatever things we want to do, especially those sinful things, we're really living under the control of Satan at that point. To be able to withstand the enemy, we have to switch allegiances. We can't be in league with Satan and just doing whatever comes to mind. We, we need to call out to Christ to be saved. You know, Paul is also the one who writes in the book of Romans that all of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. And he goes on to say that the payment that we receive for that, for doing those things that we decide, I want to do it because it feels good, but God says no and I don't care. The wages of sin, that what we earn for our sin is death. To be separated from God forever in a horrible place called hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The gift of God is the offer of forgiveness for the things we've done wrong. The offer of salvation from the consequences of those sins. And later in that book, Paul says that if you confess with your mouth Christ as your Lord, if you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is what God offers us. So to withstand the enemy, to be able to, to stand strong in the battle, you've got to belong to Christ. You have to have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And then once you have established that relationship with, by, with him by faith, once you are assured that you are God's child, then 
you need to work to kind of let go of some of the things that we can hang on to so tightly in this life. Loosen your grip on, on the things that are really only things we'll find in this world. They're not things that we're going to take with us after we die. You know, there is nothing in this life, nothing in this experience, and you can, I don't care what it is, you know, money, possessions, any, there is nothing else in this life that you could possibly have that is worth more than the relationship that you can have with God through faith in His Son. So everything other than that, just get used to holding it loosely, open-handedly. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's your paycheck or the car you drive or the city you live in or maybe it's your level of education or your gender or your looks or your family or your friends or whatever it is, any of those things. Let me tell you, none of those things are worth more than your relationship with God and none of those things define your worth either. Having or not having any of those things, your worth is not determined by any of those things. You friend, have ultimate worth for one reason, because God loves you. The God of all creation loves you, and that gives you infinite worth. The less attached we are to the things of this world, the less I think that the threat of death can cause us to fear. See, your hope, Christian, is in the Lord and in Him alone. Your hope is in the Lord and the eternal life that He has offered you through faith in Jesus Christ. We need to have our spiritual armor on. We need to be ready because the days are evil. There are difficulties that we will continue to face in this life, and Satan will attack ferociously if he perceives any gap in our armor. God has offered you protection. So take up his armor, what he has offered us for protection. Put it on and keep it on. So that's Paul's repeated call here to take up God's armor and the reason for it that we will be able to resist in the evil day. But In between those two verses we looked at, Paul also turns our attention to our true adversary. In verse 12, Paul describes the nature of our fight as well as the identity and the character of our enemy. Look with me at verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, uh, excuse me, yeah, rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Let's talk briefly about the nature of the fight that we are in spiritually. What kind of a struggle are we engaged in here? Uh, Quite simply, Paul tells us that we're going to have to wrestle with our enemy. That word struggle actually refers primarily to wrestling in in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written. It highlights the closeness of the struggle that we have with our enemy. Wrestling is a difficult way to fight. Uh, Maybe you wrestled in high school or junior high or college or something like that. Certainly you've probably seen people wrestle. It is a one-on-one thing. It is not a team sport. It is one person against one person. It is one person's strength against the strength of their opponent. And wrestling is a close contact sport. It is probably, I think, one of the only sports where you don't get in trouble for fighting with your opponent. That's what you're there for. You are intended to fight with them. Even when they are down, you need to pin them down. You look for anything you can get hold of, and you go for it. That's the nature of our fight as Christians. It it, it is the one that we are all engaged in 
as Christians. It is our struggle, Paul says. We are engaged in hand-to-hand combat with the forces of darkness. Next thing that Paul does is to make sure we know who our true adversary really is. We know that our enemy is Satan, but even before Paul tells us who our battle is against, he tells us who it is not against. Again, that first part of verse 12, he says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. See, our enemy is not primarily other people. Paul says here, our our, our fight, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, really. Those are minor players in the battle. Our struggle, as Paul will go on to say here, it's against Satan and his forces. That means we're not really fighting other people in in the, the spiritual battles and struggles we face in this life. Our enemy is not somebody who doesn't believe in God. Uh, That's not our enemy. Our enemy is not somebody who is unsure of what they believe. Our enemy is not even the person who mocks Christianity and Christians at every turn. That person's not our enemy. Our enemy is not the the secular media and, and world systems. Even though they often work relentlessly to undermine God's truth, they're not the enemy. Those are minor players. We're not to focus so much on fighting them as maybe pitying them and praying for them. They're deceived. Uh, They're prisoners of war. They are captives of Satan's way of doing things. They're serving his purposes. They need our pity. They need our prayer more than they need our fight. With the rest of verse 12 there, Paul lists off names or or groups of evil powers who are our true adversaries. And, and I don't believe he's trying to lay out and name like classifications of, of demons or what have you to try and demo, de, uh, to distinguish demonic powers. I, I think he's just trying to show us the full extent of Satan's warfare. Without digging into each and every term that he listed there in verse 12, here's what it really amounts to. First off, Paul would say, you know what? Satan's claim to control is illegitimate. God is the rightful ruler of this world for as much as Satan tries to act like it. Satan is powerful, yeah, but his power has limitations. He's a ruler of this darkness only. His nature is spiritual wickedness, and the war is waged from the spiritual realm. What we need to remember as we face the struggles in life that we face is that as we fight these spiritual battles, remember that our adversary is Satan and his forces, not the people that we encounter. Your enemy is not your neighbor. Your enemy is not your boss or your co-workers. Your enemy is not your in-laws or your parents or your spouse or your kids or your siblings. Your enemy is not your paycheck. And your enemy is not the coronavirus. Your adversary is far worse than any of those and all of those put together. Your adversary, Christian, is the one who wants to deceive you and drag you to hell. Well, to face our true adversary and the battle that we are in, God has given us his strength. He has provided us with his protection. But here's the last thing. He's also given us our strategy. God's plan for us is simple. Matter of fact, uh, Paul already mentioned it in verse 11. Look back there with me. He says, Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And now in verse 13, he repeats that same idea. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Matter of fact, that's so important that Paul even begins the next verse with it. Right there, he commands us again to do the same thing. He finishes up verse 13. After we've done everything to stand firm, verse 14, he says, stand firm, therefore. So what's our strategy? Stand firm. That's it. Stand firm. Hold your God-given ground. 
This is critical. Once we've done everything, that is, once we've made all of the necessary preparations, everything that we are kind of preparing for, the struggle that we're facing, whatever, once we've sought God's strength, once we've sought to take up the protection that he has offered us, once we've done everything, we're to stand firm against the assault. Paul's talking here about perseverance. We need to hang tough in the struggle against Satan and his forces. See, our enemy is relentless, so we need to keep on persevering. We need to stand firm. This requires that we have God's armor on. That's the only way that we're going to be able to stand firm. And we also need to remember that in this life as Christians, we persevere in this life together, not by ourselves. We're not supposed to go it alone. We're supposed to rely on God's strength and and fight side by side. The key to our ability to persevere is to stand firm in the battle. It's not only to have on the armor of God, but to remember that God calls us to fight in His strength, not our own. Standing firm means that we don't flee, we don't yield. Standing is the opposite of retreating or surrendering. We are to steadfastly resist Satan's attacks, never giving up, never giving in. And we can do all of that because God's armor is sufficient. It is enough to withstand the battle that we face. God in Christ has given us everything that we need to stand firm against and resist Satan's attacks. We are assured of the victory. Standing firm is also the only way that we are going to stay safe in the battle. God provides us armor. As you look into the rest of this passage here, the armor is all on the front. There is no armor on the back. We are protected as we face the fight, not as we retreat from it. And thirdly, standing firm is the only way that the enemy is overcome. You see, the truth is Satan is really a coward. He is. He, I mean, he, he roars and, and he puts up a good front and a good fight, but he's defeated and he knows it. He can't touch you without God's permission and he can't hurt you unless you let him. So don't give him that opening. Don't give him that foothold. Satan is an intruder. He is looking for any way that he can get into your life, into your thoughts, into your actions, a foothold of any kind. Don't give it to him. Stand firm. Hold your God-given ground. Fight and maintain the position God has given you. Standing firm means that we need to be alert, that we need to be paying attention to things in our lives because our enemy never sleeps. He is always awake and on the prowl, so we need to remain spiritually alert, always watching for his attacks. It means we need to keep an eye on all areas of our lives. You know, I need to keep an eye certainly on my tongue, on the things that I say. But you know what? I can't do that and somehow then ignore guarding my heart against lust. You know, you say, well, I'm, I'm trying to, to keep watch over my life. I'm making sure I don't steal anything. That's great. Are you making sure that you're not allowing jealousy to reign in your life? We need to keep watch over it all. Don't major on the minors. Don't get so wrapped up in doing church or acting like a Christian that you neglect kind of the primary things that we need to be doing as Christians, which is just loving people and showing compassion and humility. And, and also be especially watchful in those areas where you're weak. You know what some of your weaknesses are. I know what some of mine are. We need to keep special watch over those areas. You know, the, the weakest part of the city, that usually receives the most number of guards because they know that they have to defend that more carefully. Keep watch. Stand firm. Hold your ground. 
Let me read our whole passage as we close together this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Paul's point here is clear. We need to seek God's strength to stand firm in our struggles. We need to seek God's strength to stand firm in our struggles. God is eager. He is willing to provide us the strength we need to face the struggles we face. And we don't have to look very far in our lives to agree that we need some help. We need some strength because we constantly face difficulties and challenges and trials and temptations and the daily battle. We get it. We need it. The command to be strong in the strength of the Lord, you know what that assumes? It assumes that we need strength. We don't have to look far to figure that out. God has provided you with protection. Then secondly, he's given you his own armor. So put it on and keep it on. Be ready to fight the good fight. And that's so that you may stand firm, holding your God-given ground against our one true adversary. God is our strength. God is our protection. Satan is our adversary. And standing firm is our strategy. We need to seek God's strength to stand firm against our struggles. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you that you have offered us your strength, that you have offered us your protection. Every one of us knows, Lord, from trying to do it off and on in our own strength, we don't have what it takes I don't have it in me, God, to be able to consistently do what you want me to do. I don't have what it takes to be the man you want me to be, the pastor you want me to be. I don't have what it takes to be the husband you want me to be, the father you want me to be, the son you want me to be. I can't face the battles and the struggles in this life that I face on my own. I need you. And I thank you that you have not only promised to be there for me, but you have offered us your strength, your protection, and your strategy to square off against our one true enemy. God, help us to seek you for these things that you've offered us. Help us to look to draw close to you, God, in our relationship of faith, to to seek your strength rather than our own, to take up the armor of God that Paul lists later in this passage here and to put it on and keep it on that we might be able to stand firm where you call us to stand. God, in your strength and with your protection, we can do what you've called us to do. And we pray that it would be again to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my friends, my, my brothers and my sisters in Christ, Stand firm. Seek God's strength so that you may stand firm in your struggles. God bless you this week. 